So hello, my name is Andreas Ferber and I will be giving a status update on what's been happening um, with the OpenSUSE ARM port, in particular in terms of hardware support. Let's start with a small disclaimer. So um, I will be talking about hardware in this talk, but this is not supposed to be a guide for actually buying hardware. I will not be going into much details of the hardware, but rather into the state of what the software is looking like and where currently things are working and where things are not yet working so well. Initially, um, I'll be going through um, the um, various number of boards um, grouped by um, the architecture that they're using. Um, afterwards, um, you can kind of think of this as um, um, covering two dimensions. So on the one hand, they keep uh, new boards keep coming up and uh, new boards keep getting enabled for OpenSUSE as well then. But on the other hand, there's not just drivers getting added for boards, but obviously there's things that you may actually want to do with a board once you have it booting. So you may want to connect additional pieces of hardware for it. And uh, I will go briefly into that topic um, at the end, as well as um, covering some work for actually building software for ARM. Um, additionally, on your right-hand side, stage left, you will see a number of boards that I will be talking about later on here displayed, so feel free to walk there either during the talk or after the talk. And uh, let's uh, get started now. One key piece um, that we always need when we're dealing with ARM boards is information. That's something that in some cases is lacking, in some other cases uh, where more people are using it um, is um, um, what, more widely available. So basically you need to know how can you actually, what do you need to put on a particular medium to actually make the hardware boot. You don't have um, a BIOS usually on, on there, um, not in a UEFI firmware either on most um, non-server boards um, for the community. So. Um, you may need to actually do something to get it to show um, something on the screen or on the serial cable. Um, and uh, if you do not have such an advanced server firmware that provides ECPI tables even, then you also need a so-called device tree. Next question then is, um, does the Linux kernel, in particular the OpenSUSE kernel, already contain drivers for the various peripherals? Um, of the chip that is located on your board, um, and not just for the system on chip itself, but also for um, power supply and various other um, possibly board specific parts. It may be possible that a generic um, juice image or um, DVD image can actually boot if the board has UEFI. If that is the case, then you're all set. However, if not, and this is going to be the majority of the cases I'm going to cover next, um, then you're going to need an image that is tailored to that particular board. When preparing an image for a board um, that no one else before you has, um, has, been, has enabled, um, then you will have to um, take care of two stages. Um, so, in particular, you have to make sure that the initial init RD contains all the driver modules that are needed for um, the board to come up um, to um, the actual rootFS. Um, if you have um, the installation in DVD, basically that uh, step um, is not relevant. However, you still need to make sure that also in a second step then, um, the init RD that is generated from within the running system also contains again all those modules um, to boot for the second time again. So basically that may require doing some tweaks for, for Dracut config. As I already mentioned, um, not so many boards um, by numbers that are out there um, actually contain a UEFI firmware on some um, flash chip on the board. Um, if that is not the case, then you need such a um, just enough operating system image, for example, to get started, or some customized image with uh, um, additional um, software that you actually want to run there as an appliance. However, um, we have found that this does not scale very well, so basically on the one hand it takes time to find out how do we actually boot on a particular board, then all the, um, the necessary packages need to be accepted into factory, um, 
It then needs to build. Building that also takes time and resources, and uh, the number of onboards keeps uh, growing. In um, previous talks at last year's OpenSUSE conference here at this stage, and um, at various other events, Alexander Graf has been um, presenting work um, for making um, the U-boot bootloader um, implement the UEFI um, specification to some degree. Um, the idea with that is that um, going forward now, we actually want to move towards generic installation images or generic juice images rather than board-specific images. So the idea here is um, that we would like to split the firmware parts from the operating system parts on the other hand. That then leaves the question, where would users actually then get the, the non-generic um, pieces of the firmware to actually boot to such a point? And for that, obviously, OBS seems like a really nice fit where we're already doing this to some degree. Um, however, um, we're still seeing some issues that Kiwi simply assumes that you have a relatively standard um, Linux configuration and that you have like a boot partition or a rootfs partition on there um, with lots of files being populated from, uh, from packages, which would actually not be necessary for a pure firmware image. So that is basically where we're currently headed as a prerequisite to what you're going to hear next. Let's start with uh, the oldest generation, ARM v6. We already had the Raspberry Pi 1 Model B working with Tumbleweed um, last year. So what's been new is that the Raspberry Pi 0 is no longer um, a theory that no one can actually purchase, but it's actually possible to get your hands on one by now, at least in some regions of the world. Um, and uh, basically, the, um, the same U-boot package that we're using on the um, Raspberry Pi 1 is also working for the Raspberry Pi 0, um, as well as the kernel and the juice image can simply be reused and are actually working, including the UEFI support. Even newer now is the 0W, which has an additional um, wireless chip on there. Unfortunately, this is not working at all. So basically, you don't even get um, serial output from, um, from, from U-Boot. Um, and at this point, there is neither um, a DTS file available um, nor any work on, on that device yet. Does anyone here in the audience happen to have one? OK. A few hands, OK. Yeah. So if you find anything out about that, Make sure to let us know, but at this point, unfortunately, um, OpenSUSE is not yet running on there. Moving on to ARM v7 then. Um, in particular here, I'm very proud to present that we have another, commun um, another contribution by a community member, Frank Kunz. Um, he had this DE0 nano SOC board with um, a Cyclone 5 SOC, and he's packaged U-Boot to run on there. And uh, UEFI just happened to work on there, out of the box. Um, I believe he's using the kernel default, because obviously kernel LPIE wouldn't work. And there is a factory image with uh, the name here that uh, um, you'll just have to read for yourself. Um, so basically, this is all working in OpenSUSE Tumbleweed by now. Thank you very much. Then an update on the Firefly RK3288. Um, there has been a bit of fluctuation on which U-Boot versions actually boot on it. The current version in Factory 2017.05 is working again. Um, I did have the kernel LPIE image um, booting on there, but unfortunately we haven't been able to get the juice image working. It's simply, um, I think it gets stuck during early con already. Um, similarly, um, oh no, sorry, I, I mixed those up. So basically, the Firefly um, gets um, to a point where devices um, actually um, are starting to get enumerated and loaded um, on serial. So basically, there's probably some modules missing in the in the init RD. Then um, a few people have been asking about the Tinko board. This is um, a board using the very same chip, but in a Raspberry Pi form factor um, by ASUS. 
And uh, we do have U-Boot working on there, but unfortunately, in this case, the juice image is stuck in early con because this uses a different um, power management IC. Um, so basically, um, either some modules are still missing in there, um, or we may need to change some modules to, to build in for there. Does anyone in the audience here today happen to have one? Okay. Then some users had asked for the um, Udo Neo board. Um, there is a Udo package for that now. Um, I also prepared a juice image, but um, it is getting beyond the um, init RD. Um, however, it um, hangs at some point, I think, after Ednaviv is initialized. So either um, it's an issue between um, the various models of the Udoneo basic board um, or some pin muxing or some other setting in the device tree might be um, wrong. Then an update on uh, the guitar module. Um, Last time I reported that uh, basically nothing was mainline and uh, um, OpenSUSE was not running on there. Uh, this is still the case at this point. However, um, I sat down and started writing patches in order to boot a mainline kernel on there. And it's at this point, it's possible to boot into an init RD, but not yet further because drivers for um, SD card and other devices like USB are still missing. The Nano Pineo is one of several um, Sanchi devices based on the, um, H, um, the H3 SOC. Uh, we have a package in factory um, since recently, but now that is actually booting. Unfortunately, as for most um, all Windows devices, UEFI support um, is not yet working inside U-Boot. Um, so if anyone has those, such devices, I'm pretty sure there will be someone listening to this talk. Um, we need people that actually sit down and debug why that is, adding some debug statements to U-Boot and possibly adding some memory reservations to make that work. Um, we have an image available. It boots. Everything uh, worked out of the box, surprisingly, for once. That was a really nice experience. Um, however, um, some users actually wanted not the Neo, but the Neo Air to work. And uh, that is still not um, working. So we have an Enopineo Air package by now. Um, however, the kernel does not have the um, device tree. So the question is, does the device tree that is contained in U-Boot is sufficient for that? And unfortunately, I did not yet get feedback from the community on whether that is the case. So if you have such a board, please let us know. Um, if, you sell, if you tell us that it actually works, then we can enable that um, juice image in um, Tumbleweed. Another board of that same family, which by the way, you can all see um, over there on the tables, um, is the M1 Plus. Um, the M1 Plus is based um, on the M1 design, as far as I understand, and adds Wi-Fi on top of that. Um, there were some patches for the M1 model, but uh, no work for the M1 Plus at this point yet. So um, if we get time, we might actually work on that, but uh, let, let's see about that. Maybe someone else is quicker. We have... Um, some Orange Pi image already um, in, uh, in OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. Um, they recently made a new model based on a very new SOC by um, the company called RDA. Um, it's a um, rather low-end Cortex-A5 with, I think, only 256 megabytes of RAM. Um, unfortunately, as with many new SOCs, there is absolutely no support for it. And um, as is, we can't really do anything with it. Um, However, um, earlier um, this year, um, an Orange Pi i96 was announced at Lenara Connect, um, which is um, um, in the uh, 96 boards, in this case, IoT edition form, um, form format. Um, but um, it is not yet clear to me whether that will be a community-supported board or an actual Lenara reference board. So um, let's see how this software support turns out going forward. In a similar category, um, in Japan, there is a so-called FQ96 board um, by Fujitsu. 
Um, there are huge patches available um, on top of older versions of U-Boot and the kernel. Um, however, there doesn't seem to be any work on making that um, supported in the mainline versions of kernel and U-Boot. Um, so we've been in talks to um, improve the situation there and uh, let's see how that uh, pans out going forward. Unfortunately, we did not manage to get one here in time for, for the conference. Moving on to 64-bit territory. The Raspberry Pi 3, which unfortunately we do not have here today. Um, so um, unfortunately we're not able to show anything with a display that's there, but uh, we can show serial output um, later on um, after this talk. Um, we did have Raspberry Pi images based on the 42.2 kernel um, um, around, well, Mid of last year already, by now it is available um, built in a factory with factory kernel. There are some differences of note in particular. Um, the factory uh, image does not contain any support for, um, for Wi-Fi, whereas the 42.2 image has backports by ZUSA that do enable this. And thanks to Alexander Graf and Fabian Vogt in particular, who have been doing a great job working on those images. An update on the Pine 64. So there had been community images for that in, in Contrib for quite some time already. Um, by now, it's actually possible to boot um, the, um, the Tumbleweed kernel if you're willing to sacrifice a bit of functionality. So in particular, network was not yet working. But if you have a USB to Ethernet adapter, then you can easily walk around that. Right, and um, be aware that there are some upcoming changes coming. So um, currently, um, the U-boot package that we're building in factory only contains the actual U-boot binary, um, and we're using some tools um, to actually make it boot um, with um, an all-winner firmware, whereas the next version of U-boot that we don't have um, packaged yet will actually include a secondary program loader support so that basically we have an all open source um, solution for, um, for the Pine64. Um, however, um, currently we do not have the ARM trusted firmware packages in Tumbleweed, so we would be able to build a U-boot Pine64 image a package in uh, factory, but um, that package would need to be rebuilt in the contrib in order to actually provide um, the, the full booting support for, um, for that new booting approach. Based on the same SOC, once again, there is a NanoPi A64. Um, there is um, no um, DTS for that yet. Should be relatively easy to add if someone has interest um, in that particular one. It's simply been a matter of time in finishing a lot of um, enablements uh, for for this conference. But that should be possible simply based on the software that is available for the Pine 64. Also leveraging much of the work that we had already done for the Pine 64, it's possible to boot the Orange Pi PC2. Um, using the um, Pine64 juice image simply by using a different bootloader. At this point in time, we do not have packages for that yet, but it was possible to build that by using the um, upstream U-boot sources and adding a, a couple patches on top. It, by now, it might actually work using master branch of, of U-boot um, tree since uh, this week, I think. And again, reusing the same chip, another board of that family, um, there is um, a patch available. Um, the patch for U-Boot works. Um, unfortunately, um, I've not been able to test the, um, the juice image on there, not, not successfully tested. I'm assuming that's because a juice image is too large for 512 MB board at this point in time. So if you have like an older Raspberry Pi, you may want to double check that it actually um, still, still works for you. And please let us know on the mailing list then, or open a bug. A short update on the Geekbox. Um, I have... Uh, unofficial um, ATF uh, packages um, building by now, and there is the beginnings of an upstream U-boot port. Um, this is not yet in the 2017 or 5 version, but should be in master branch at least soon. I think not yet. 
Um, at this point, only serial works. So in theory, you could use Minicom, PicoCom, or some other tool like that in order to transfer a kernel via the serial cable, but that's really no fun. So um, better wait, and hopefully at some point, we're going to have um, drivers for um, SD card. The successor to that particular SOC is the 3399. Um, we've been able to boot um, U-Boot on that board yet. However, um, the number of boot devices um, supported is not yet that big. Um, EMMC was working for me. I also found a branch um, where network was working with some restrictions, and I heard that I believe Heiko has a branch where supposedly USB is working. So yes, that is just being confirmed. Thank you very much for that. Hoping that will soon find its way into mainline as well. So last year, once again, I had talked about the Bubblegum 96, and I believe I was asking whether anyone in the audience had access to one. Um, that was not the case. Um, one of our Chinese colleagues uh, managed to get one, um, uh, one such board to, to Germany. And uh, based on that, um, I've been able to um, do some initial enablement for that. Um, however, at this point, still only booting into, in, in, into an init RD works, but there's still no drivers for, um, for SD card or other devices. Again, similar situation for the Andromeda Box Edge. Um, I did some initial upstream patches for that. One can boot into an init RD uh, with a minor MDT hack, um, but uh, no open SUSE yet for lack of drivers, and in particular because I did not get the clock drivers to work yet. The so-called um, Armada 8040 community board has been rebranded Macchiato bin since last year. Um, still the same layout and hardware. Um, we have um, a package, um, a Hubert package available for that. We've tested that one via chain loading, um, but unfortunately the um, drivers in Hubert and the kernel do not match. So basically I was able to install from SD card via Juice EFI image onto um, a Zada disk. However, um, obviously in that case, the uh, kernels um, get installed onto the SATA disk, and then on next boot you can actually access the newly installed kernel. So um, that's still rather um, hacky, and let's hope that uh, drivers make progress in U-boot for that to work. Or since last week or the week before, there's instructions available for building um, EDK2, um, which at this point I haven't packaged yet. But the kernel did work for that board, and um, like I said, um, the generic um, EFI juice um, boots on that board and can be used. Only for, for some of those um, boards not uh, sticking to the SPSA specification, it's necessary to switch the console from TTY AMA0 to TTY S0 or whatever it is for the particular hardware, if it doesn't um, supply the path so that you can simply drop it. Um, a similar um, chip from Marvell um, is being used on the Espresso bin. Um, however, unfortunately, the driver situation in U-Boot has been fluctuating. So at some point, um, SATA was actually working. Um, it, uh, it regressed in 2017 or 5, so um, I'm hoping that will improve uh, going forward so that we can actually build images for that one. We also um, are showing an NXP-based um, board um, where we have UBIT prepared for. Um, unfortunately, there's no instructions on how to actually use that with, so it would be necessary to load that by a network and uh, chain load it, which is uh, still to be tested. Does anyone here happen to have one? The Freedom board from NXP? Then, very, very new, there is finally software for the Poplar board. Um, I uh, did manage to get it working just days before the conference, pretty much the day before that. Um, there are some initial packages um, for um, U-Boot and L-Loader available in a contrib. Those work. 
Um, there are also, there's a patch available to a script in order to build um, a bootable um, partition table and, um, and partitions. Um, however, using Linux Next, um, EMMC is working. So from that particular installation script, you can actually boot into OpenSUSE. Um, I believe also SD is working in the kernel. However, SD was not working in, in U-Boot. So using external images is still a bit tricky because uh, U-Boot supports USB, but um, the kernel, at least in my build, did not support USB yet. But at least it's looking much more positive than uh, some months ago. Very new, we have the hardware here, but no OpenSUSE running on there yet, is the Hikey 960. Um, there are initial um, kernel patches available for that one yet. Um, however, the um, links to, um, to the EDK firmware I just received um, the other day, so there was not enough time to, to prepare that, but um, probably in some uh, weeks or months, uh, we will have some, some initial image um, working on there, hopefully. So now, for the first half hour, we've been talking about um, development boards, and I now want to take some time to look at some, uh, some other hardware as well. So um, what other devices are there that we might run OpenSUSE on? So um, when the ARM port was still very early, some people tried to um, use their ARM-based phones, root their Android, run a change root in there with some OpenSUSE packages in there simply to have some um, place to, to run things on. Um, it's not something that I've been personally focusing on because um, phones and tablets often have the problem that you don't get serial access. I've tried to do that for the Nexus 9 once, but uh, I never managed to get the, um, the serial to, to actually work, limiting the, um, the things that you can then actually try with, with uh, mainline kernels on there. Um, but uh, for instance, we had um, OpenSUSE running on the Samsung Chromebook, the initial ARM one, and uh, I got it working on the HP Chromebook 11 as well, for some time at least. Um, then more recently, there are some do-it-yourself kits for building your own um, laptop. So there are ones available um, based on um, the Raspberry Pi, and there's also one available from... Um, um, I forget the name. It's based on the uh, um, on the the A sixty four chip. Remind me what the company name? The, the guys in Bulgaria, yeah. Olimex, yes, right. The ones with the Olimex. Uh, Olinoxino and so on, right? So there's um, kits like that available for building your own lot, um, your own um, notebooks um, with um, with a chip that you can then actually also debug in better ways than you can with consumer devices like um, uh, well Chromebooks mostly. And obviously, for the record, there are servers that are running ARM, and we did see the presentation of the. Um, um, from, from SoftIron at, uh, at the keynote last uh, OpenSUSE conference. Those devices are available, but, well, they're, they're not exactly um, available for, for small budgets at this point yet. Um, so they, they do exist, and we have OpenSUSE running on multiple of them, but we've usually not been covering them because it's not what most people here in the audience are actually going to have access to. Um, and then to the final part, um, routers, um, NAS devices, and TV boxes. Um, are available from lots of um, vendors, um, in some cases with um, device trees in mainline kernel support already available, and in other cases it's um, possible to do that in fairly easy ways. When playing with those, failure is always a possibility. So like I said, um, doing my own electrical um, circuit for making the um, headphone output switch to a serial output on the Nexus 9 didn't quite work, so um, I pretty much gave up those efforts. Um, I had also worked on a MediaTek-based um, Xiaomi box, um, TV box, that is. Um, I did not manage to locate the serial pins to get any output from there. Um, and then um, there was a, a Kickstarter project called the Roboard, 
Um, but unfortunately, um, unlike their initial plans, it was actually chipped in a way that no one can actually really uh, tinker with it. Um, so there is no bootloader access um, to those at all. There should be some JTAG pins um, if one locates them and actually wires them up and writes the necessary drivers to do something with that. Um, but at this point, it's not possible to run them, um, to run open source on that board. If you try some, some of those consumer devices that are not yet documented to work, obviously chances are that people can't tell you what you need to do if you see this error or if you don't get output at all. Um, so basically, um, use external media, don't override the EMMC, think about uh, what you're going to do when um, the kernel gets stuck or uh, you override something by accident and maybe your, um, your partition is gone. Um, do backups if you can, like um, do a DD from an Android that is shipping on the device, back that up to another device. That's a fairly safe way. In some cases, there are USB-based um, backup solutions. We've been um, packaging a few tools to help with that. So for um, there's the Sunchi tools available. And uh, I've prepared a need to resubmit the um, RK develop tool for, for Rockchip. Um, so yeah, you may find information what to do for certain types of devices in general, but usually not specific to those devices. And in particular, where um, the vendor is located, it might become difficult to sue them to actually give you all the um, GPL sources and instructions on how to actually make something um, bootable out of those sources for a particular device. Now, um, already last year, um, I uh, got my hands on this particular TV box, the Vega S95. Um, it was one of the first devices with uh, two gigabytes running the very new, at that point in time, Amlogic S905 M chip. It was the first 64-bit chip from that particular vendor. And um, in the meantime, I've managed to get a um, chain-loaded mainline U-boot to work on there. So basically, I'm, I'm loading U-boot via the network and then jumping into the new U-boot so that we actually have UEFI support in there. And uh, by now, there is also, since the 2017 or 5 version, there is um, MMC support, so it's possible to, um, to load things from, um, from an SD card. Tumbleweed kernel is working on there out of the box. And... Um, just be careful that because it works on this particular board um, or box device does not mean that it may work on another device that you have access to that may require some, some tweaks. Maybe the, um, the firmware is more restrictive, does not give you a prompt to enter the necessary boot commands, so it may require some, some more tinkering um, based on what exactly you want to do. Also, um, on the next slide, I'll um, go a bit more into how um, the, the firmware um, is uh, structured in this case, so um, the reason um, that I'm chain loading in this case is that um, I have not yet successfully tested the tools to make a firmware image out of U-Boot that can actually be flashed onto EMMC or another uh, bootable device there. Again, when thinking about recovery strategies, one such strategy might be if the device is capable of booting on SD card, either than doing such experiments on SD card. But unfortunately, uh, in most cases like here, the um, um, EMMC comes before SD in the enumeration order. Um, so basically, one would um, need to back up the EMMC probably and then do experiments on SD or directly on EMMC. The good news is that um, besides those TV boxes, there's also development boards available that have better access to pins and more documentation available. So by now there is a juice image available for the Odroid C2. It works out of the box and in order to get to this point, I had to um, hack together um, some tools that are packaged as Mison tools. Mison is the code name for this family of um, system on chips. Um, basically, the um, U-boot bootloader is combined with some ATF-like firmware blobs and um, amended by certain headers that have um, description about offsets, sizes, and checksums. And there was a proprietary tool available from Amlogic 
um, for x86 machines. Um, you can find that in various GitHub re repositories. Um, however, we are building our ARH64 images inside OBS on ARH64 hardware, so we can't really execute um, x86 binaries, even if we were allowed to use x86 binaries without sources to build our, our packages in there. Um, so what I did was write um, a new tool called AML Bootsig, which basically was created by um, comparing binary output of um, input and output files of uh, used with the original tool, and then starting to uh, to write the tool in such a way that it generates the same output or at least similar output by now to, um, as the original proprietary tool, and uh, this is working for this particular board. If you have other boards. Um, I am very happy about any feedback on whether this board works simply because there is no documentation available for this format and much of this has been guesswork including the names of struct field and uh, what they actually mean and are um, supposed to contain. Based on the same chip, there's another development board available since recently, the NanoPi K2. Um, I've sent trivial patches to, to get it booting and uh, it is working, however, um, there is no um, contrib image for that yet because um, on the one hand, we don't have a U-boot package yet. Um, the um, firmware blobs are not yet packaged um, and um, well, my tools are working with that, but well, there simply is no um, fully booting Juice image yet, but basically, uh, sorry, I keep saying that. Um, you need to combine a self-built bootloader with the juice image in order to get it to boot. S905X is a distinct chip from S905. Um, at this point in time, there is only downstream U-boot support, so it's not in mainline. Um, I have not yet tested um, our kernel on there. I do know that um, the Maison tools do not support this particular chip yet, so that will require some more um, trial testing. Um, and because of all that, obviously there's no juice image for that available yet. Um, someone on the mailing list um, was reporting that he simply took um, another Linux image and simply used our um, Juice Rudefest tarball. That's obviously an option for, for many of such cases. Um, but, well, obviously we want to have a, a proper solution that we can um, give to our users in LBS. At FOSDEM, I had shown a TV box running um, the S912 chip. U-boot for that um, is not yet available mainline. Um, I have submitted patches to make um, the mainline kernel boot on there. That was what I was showing at FOSDEM. Um, not here today, sadly. Um, and the AML boot image tool does not support the S912 either at this point in time. Now, something that I'm very proud of having accomplished is uh, I got my hands on a TV box with a very new Realtek 64-bit SOC. There are unfortunately absolutely no sources available, neither for the bootloader nor, nor for the kernel. Um, but um, by, um, after a long time of having no success with this, um, I found a way to actually boot um, a U image on there. Um, and by now it's possible to boot into um, an init RD. And um, since uh, yesterday, the uh, patches for that are also integrated into the Linux Next tree and hopefully will make it either into 4.12 or 4.13. In addition to some of the rock chip development boards already mentioned earlier, there's also TV boxes. Um, I know that Matthias Broga has worked on a um, TV box at some point with the RK3368. Did you have success with that yet? Not, not fully, okay. 
Um, I did not have success here yet either, um, but I would um, wanted to mention this for completeness because um, at this point in time, we are starting to see the first devices, the first consumer devices ship with a U-boot that is new enough to actually contain Alex Graf's UEFI support. So this has a modified version of 2017-01 on there. And um, it's possible to um, reboot into the Rock USB mode and connect to the board with the RK Develop tool um, that is upcoming for factory. Um, however, I have not yet managed to actually get into the mask ROM mode that would be necessary to uh, to flash a, an updated or modified version of, of U-Boot on there. Heiko, have you been able to play with any such devices or boards yet? Okay. So. But uh, I'm pretty sure, so there is, um, Rocktrip is actively working on this, and there's, um, it should be available, in the, something should be available in the upcoming U-Boot version, and then the question is how much changes might actually be necessary to make it work on um, not their internal reference boards, but the devices that we actually have um, access to as mere models. Last but not least, um, last year we had the um, Tourist Omnia, um, in the room, um, that's a, a, a Wi-Fi uh, router um, that was launched on, on Indiegogo. And uh, Michael here um, in the room um, is uh, working for the company that, that did it. Um, by now, I have OpenSUSE booting on there. Um, both me and someone else worked on upstream patches. It's available in the kernel yet. Um, Already, however, um, the U-Boot that it was shipping did not have support for our init RD. And um, since a couple of uh, days, possibly weeks, there are patches for mainline available um, where we're still waiting for, for a second revision and then hopefully uh, we should start to be able to um, boot OpenSUSE on there without major hacks. So far for the first part of this talk. Now if we're um, looking beyond just getting the hardware to boot our operating system and having sufficient drivers in there, uh, many of those development boards at least have connectors where you can actually um, attach sensors, motors, and various other devices and buses. If we look at the Raspberry Pi, for instance, then it has this um, originally 26 pin, now a 40 pin connector uh, with various functions available. And the way that it works in Raspbian is that um, there is a number of DTPO files delivered on the boot partition and you can configure either manually via the uh, config text or via a tool that uh, they are shipping. Um, to have those DTPO files applied as overlays to the base device tree. Um, whereas in the case of mainline kernels and uh, OpenSUSE, we do not have any DTPO files yet. I've started um, preparing some for the boards, the expansion boards, and in some cases, um, external sensors or devices that I had um, accessible. Um, but this is um, not yet um, sorted out how this will actually move forward. Obviously, there's questions of how can we actually possibly reuse snippets for such um, device trees that on the one hand need to connect to a board-specific device tree, but where basically the functions that each expansion board is providing are always the same. So this is not yet really um, solved at this point in time yet. And the solution that I have been testing on OpenSUSE is to simply write a, um, a boot script for U-Boot that um, after U-Boot has loaded the uh, device tree, the base device tree, it applies a hard-coded um, set of um, trees that happen to match my hardware. And uh, afterwards, the kernel can simply reuse all the devices in the tree. Um, if we look, um, if we look further into the future, then the idea is 
that also the kernel should be able to apply some of those device tree overlays, at least when um, you don't need it to um, load something from inside U-Boot, um, which is a whole other topic. It also really depends on live device tree in, in U-Boot. Um, but um, for, for the, the, the standard cases, um, the idea is that you would actually install into the Linux file system a set of DTBO files and you would configure them to be applied in some way, possibly via a, user sp um, a um, um, systemd daemon or um, simply by a self-written unit file. Maybe long-term it would be even an idea to have a YAST module to configure um, such um, well, GPIOs and expansion boards, but um, as long as we don't know how exactly the underlying tools will look like, um, we haven't really ventured into that territory yet. So I'm going to show two projects that I've been working from just as examples of what is possible. So um, I had access to a very small uh, microcontroller kit that had a detachable um, I2C connected um, sensor on it. There was no mainline kernel, of, um, mainline kernel driver available for this particular chipset. And um, obviously if you need to um, um, to write an over overlay file yourself, the first thing to find out is what you actually need to write into there to make it work. Um, on the next slide, I will show a bit about generic um, drivers. There are, there is an um, I square C dev driver uh, where you can generically access um, I square C devices from user space. Um, However, what I was looking into was a real kernel driver for this, and it's actually pretty easy to write once you actually have um, the data sheet available, which for those uh, ones here is available. Um, so basically, um, I just need to, to add the, the finishing touches and get that into mainline kernel. And that is something that anyone having such boards really should look into. It's easy to do in some cases, and um, is simply the um, um, the most reliable um, way to use certain boards in the driver. You will find lots of um, instructions um, in the web that will tell you to download um, particular libraries, but a lot of them have licensing and also functional problems when using them with a the mainline kernel and um, depending on what software you actually have to then um, combine it with. There's more sensor drivers in the same category. The next one um, I'm still working on. Um, in theory, it should be possible to use, for example, TPM chips from Infineon with a mainline kernel. Um, the current generation is SPI-based. The previous one was I2C-based. Unfortunately, the SPI-based ones um, don't really get recognized, although in this case there are mainline drivers available already. Um, I'm not sure yet and hope that uh, we can sort that out with them together. There's a number of Arduino shields available and um, in case you're not yet aware, um, I've started documenting in the wiki based on uh, suggestions from, um, from Michal over there, Michal Suchanek. Um, and there are various adapters available that you can actually use, for example, a Raspberry Pi board with the 40-pin connector. From there, go to an Arduino connector and then you basically can use almost the whole range of um, Arduino boards that are available um, out there um, as long as the voltage levels are compatible and as long as the board that you're using it with has the right functions available on the pins. So for example, there are boards available that do not have SPI implemented in hardware, so you would need to either use a bit banging, sorry, bit banging on the GPIO pins, um, or um, simply use um, another board that actually has those functions available where a particular hardware design expects it. The second project to showcase um, that uh, I would have loved to talk about more, but unfortunately is very slow going. Um, so in case you don't know what LoRa is, this is a wireless technology for um, low powerless wide area networks. So you can go for maybe three kilometers, have a signal transmitted by using a certain um, a signal spectrum. And um, there are, um, there is among others, um, a protocol um, available called LoRaWAN, um, which um, 
Unlike some other protocols, like for example, Zigfox and the new NB-IoT is actually um, available um, so that you can run your own gateways. So basically you can have end-to-end -end communication via this um, um, technology, in theory all uh, running on OpenSUSE. Um, there are some um, various GitHub projects to do this in user space. Um, however, every time you try to use the SPIDEF driver on mainline kernels, you get a huge warn on stack trace that you're not supposed to do this. We had some conversations about this at FOSDEM with some of the SPI um, maintainers and they do not intend to change this because they're saying and that's not the right way to use SPI devices unless that particular use case has been vetted to be absolutely necessary and their recommended, their recommended workaround, I wouldn't call it solution, was to reuse the device tree compatible from one of those whitelisted devices instead of the, the one, uh, instead of the, um, the literal SPIDEF um, name in order to get around that, but that's not really a clean solution. And uh, as already mentioned, um, a number of, um, in particular, one very widespreadly used um, GPIO library for the Raspberry Pi um, is under LGPL 3.0. And later, whereas most of the software that people are trying to use with this is under GPL2, which we cannot legally package in, uh, in OBS, unfortunately. So basically, the software for user space is not in a very great shape. There's no kernel driver. So um, I was asking about this at a um, Laura talk at FOSDEM. Apparently, no one at that point in time had been working on um, kernel drivers for those particular chipsets. So um, I started to do that on my own once again. Um, I'm not really um, a networking expert on that uh, socket layer in, uh, in the Linux kernel, so things have been a bit rough for me. Um, but I do have... Um, modules available in this particular GitHub repository um, that can be um, compiled against an installed OpenSUSE kernel. Um, it's doing some weird hacks like reusing um, socket um, identifiers um, in order to not go beyond the list of defined protocols. Um, so um, some care must be taken to, uh, um, to not run into weird errors. Um, but it's possible to test such things. Also, um, on the previous slide, um, the, um, um, the sensor driver that I developed, I did that um, as a local kernel module in the running OpenSUSE system. So um, I'm very much encouraging people that if they have a working OpenSUSE kernel, they can actually use that for um, development of additional drivers or backports of um, additional drivers on top of that as uh, in particular uh, a KMP if you do it in, in, uh, in OBS, or if you do it locally, you can just build the KMP and uh, forcefully insert it. Um, it will show an ugly taint warning, but it works. After having spy driver prepared, I also um, set out to write the first um, Zerdev-based uh, driver. So this is um, new in um, 4.11. Um, it's a way that you can actually enslave a kernel driver to a serial port. So usually you would get, if you have a serial port enabled in your device tree, you would get some TTY whatever device inside the kernel and then you can use user space tools to read and write from that um, device. In this case, you can have a kernel driver implementing um, serial-based protocols. Um, there's initial drivers being prepared for some Bluetooth chipsets. That was the main driver on, on various boards. So um, on the um, Raspberry Pi 3, 42.2 image, um, it's necessary to call um, HCI attach in order to load the firmware onto the actual, um, onto the, the, the Bluetooth module, the, the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module um, for uh, for Bluetooth to work, and the idea is to have all this handled uh, by the kernel. Um, similarly, um, the Pine64 has um, a Z-Wave module available for um, um, home range uh, wireless um, communication. Um, in theory, it should be possible um, to uh, write kernel drivers for all those technologies wherever it makes sense to abstract a generic interface so that user space no longer needs to know which hardware exactly it is actually dealing with. Approaching the end of the talk, um, 
Cross compilers have been an issue occasionally coming up. Obviously, you can build ARM software inside OBS running on ARM hardware, both 32-bit and 64-bit. With ARMv6, I regret to say that we've currently been having for some packages some uh, emulation problems ever since uh, glibc introduced some um, optimization. So you may see some weird um, assertions on ARMv6, but ARMv7 and ARMv8 should work um, well enough. However, if you're building a kernel, maybe you just want to um, uh, cross-compile it from your um, x86-based notebook. So there are um, these cross-compilers available just for reference. Um, they're only suitable for the kernel. The 32-bit version is, can also be used for U-boot when using a, a U-boot internal uh, libgcc copy. I have um, prepared in the last days a um, new lib-based ARM cross-compiler. Um, this should work for any um, firmware development for Cortex-M devices. I'm not yet sure whether um, how far it works for, for Cortex-A. Um, so if anyone is interested in that, please give it a go. And the next step, obviously, would be to prepare also a cross-compiler like this for ART64, so that, again, uh, we can also have our OpenSUSE cross-compiler available in order to build U-Boot for ART64 via cross. So that is it for this talk. We still have some minutes left for your questions. I know I've talked a lot, don't be shy. Um, <coughs> works, yes. Um, yeah, you might not know it, but in front of you there's a nice Zedo box with the Starming an M Star MSO chip 9180 down there on the ground, which is capturing the HDMI signal and giving it back scale to the beamer and to our input source for recording. At the moment it's running some Android with some nasty vendor app which is recording the HDMI and giving it out to the output. I would like to see it next year running on Tumbleweed, of course. I think we all agree that that would be, uh, would be nice to have. However, this is not really a wish concert. You can express your wishes, but it will need someone to actually work on it. Um, it was difficult to get all the hardware that uh, I've worked on um, here for this event this year. And uh, of course, you can assume that it takes quite some time. I'm trying to navigate back to, I think that was on the failure slide. So um, it's, I did not quite catch the exact number but it sounds like a similar chip as on the robot, So I would not be too hopeful. So the thing is that um, I have actually talked to a representative from MSTAR about it, and that person said that there is nothing inherently blocking um, other people from booting something from via their bootloader such as us as a Linux distribution. However, that depends on the bootloader configuration from, that, from the particular vendor. So basically, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. And in addition to that, um, there are no kernel drivers upstream for that. So you'd need to get access to the sources for the device. And um, they use their own, I think it's called mboot bootloader which is not related to U-Boot. So um, I'm not sure whether sources for that one are available and how well it's documented, what exactly to do with that. However, um, if, you, um, if you use Google, you will find slides from, I think, the Narrow Connect 2016, where their director of 96 boards was mentioning an upcoming MSTAR-based um, 96 board, which I think would even have a 64-bit sock on there, but obviously that would not help with a particular device that you have access to. The question would rather be, would any of all these devices um, be realistic to get into a state where they're doing video input and output processing in the way that you need them for this particular use case?
Exactly, because I mean, it's probably not really interesting to have Tumbleweed running on the, the Tumbleweed kernel running and having a serial output in a network device, but what you want is the HDMI input, HDMI output, and HDMI capture, and hell will freeze over before you get this without closed source vendor drivers. I mean, I have all those TV boxes that you mentioned are probably all IPTV boxes, correct? They don't have any Most tuners. And some do, some don't. Okay, because I mean, I've, I'm working for about almost 15 years now with set-top boxes, with satellite set-top boxes, and you never ever, the only thing where you get an open source driver is the old D-Box 2, which was simply hacked. And so, and which was actually hacked with, uh, with help from the hardware vendor, as is known today. So, uh, all those multimedia boxes are probably hardly worth spending lots of time because, I mean, it's uh, fun for, for education to have the kernel booting, but you often cannot do really much um, uh, interesting things with it because you will never be able to get, uh, or never, uh, it's, it's unlikely that you will get uh, video in or out there apart. The only one where this really works are the Raspberry Pis because they have the uh, rather open uh, drivers. That's, that's my... And even there, the driver situation is progressing very slowly at this point. Yeah, but, but at least you have, you have access to the encoder and the decoder and stuff, and so you can, you can actually use this. So. But so, it's really interesting um, and... Mm -hmm. It's, it's I, I think I forgot to mention that um, after I did the, the initial patch set for, for the S905, um, Baylibra was contracted to do um, mainline enablement for, um, for the Amlogic um, chips that are being used in many of those um, Chinese TV boxes. And um, in the 4.12 kernel, HDMI should be working as output, and I believe there's also some work on, uh, on video encoding, I thought, but I'm not entirely sure. So it, it, really, it will depend on the particular vendor. So okay. we're, we've been in contact with Rockchip, and there are like GStreamer packages and other open source bits available. Some vendors are trying real hard to, to be a good open source citizen. Um, but um, if you buy the box, that's not the state that they will actually ship at this point. And, um, well, it, you're right that it will take time and I'm, effort I'm to do this on particular be, boxes. I'm certainly hoping to be yeah. uh, surprised in a positive way because I'm actually looking for or people asking me for quite some years what's an open source TV box to buy, and I say, yeah. There is none, basically. I mean, there, there are all those, all those uh, I'm usually uh, hacking on satellite TV setup boxes, and there are different, different states of closed, but they all have closed source drivers, and they're all crap, basically. So it's, it's just a selection of crap <laughs> that you can get. So I would be, I'd like to be positively surprised, but I won't hold my breath for it. So, so you, you do have a point there, and I have to maybe point out that um, when I'm working on some of those TV boxes, I'm not working on the TV boxes in order to get video encoding or TV streaming working, but rather um, I'm using that as um, a means to get early access to some of the chips as long as no development boards are available. So yes, um, my use case is not really getting to, to that full-fledged system, but um, I found that if you actually document and make initial patches available so that um, people can have a semi-working system, then more people are likely to contribute to that port than if you're just sitting for a box where you're, not getting, where you're having a black screen on HDMI and you're not getting anything sensible coming out of the serial system. So it depends on how large the community is and obviously um, there's a much larger um, Sanchi community than for, for some of those others more odd vendors that I've mentioned here. Um, and well, yes, it depends on individuals to contribute drivers to, to make things work. And it's questionable whether we will ever get to 100%. So one thing that I omitted from this talk simply because there's been no real progress is Mali. Um, so there's often confusion in that um, if you actually want to have 
graphic output on a board via HDMI connector or whatever the board offers, you don't need to have Mali drivers. Mali drivers are only for 3D acceleration. Um, they're not currently mainline available. There are GPL drivers available, and I even have some of them packaged in um, Contrib Mali. Um, however, they keep breaking whenever the kernel um, gets updated, and it will require a lot of uh, documentation and tinkering how to find out uh, which version of the driver to combine with um, which device tree overlay and which binary user space download from whatever external source in order to possibly make that work. Um, have you looked into the Halium project? Because what well, could you repeat the name, please? Halium. Plus? Halium. Okay. Well, Halium project. Honey. Is so like the Halium. like what we eat. Halium. No. Like in H honeycomb. A Halium. H A L L I U M. So the project oh. that um, Plasma Phone and UB Ports people started, so that this. Devices, well, these platforms can run on different devices. Okay, well, maybe you can take a look at it. It could make your life easy somehow, somewhat, and being friends with them could be useful for you, maybe. In, you in which way could you, could you describe that? <laughs> okay, um, well, I'm not speaking for the project, right? But the idea is that um, you, you know Leap Hybrid, for example, and mm. um, so when you try to port a Linux system into a mostly phone devices and, and tablets, you have the problem that you get the drivers for, for Android, but you don't get um, for anything else. And while you've been mostly talking about how getting output from HDMI is success, well, in practice, it's not really success unless you just want to show like a static thing, right? Uh, as long as you want to have humans interacting with it and a touchscreen, you want to have accelerated uh, graphics. So what, um, well, Yola started doing was um, using Android uh, graphics uh, drivers. And so, so basically you're saying that there is, um, the software project is making Linux compatible user space parts available to use an Android kernel with an open source file yeah, system plus those additions. Essentially. So the thing is that uh, Leap Hybrid, for example, was there for, for a while, but it was only available for some devices. Mm -hmm. What they're trying to do is to kind of get a pool of devices, mostly phones and tablets, that, that are supported. Like if I told you today, port a plasma phone to my device, you would tell me, well, I don't really know where to start from, right? And mm -hmm. Well, there's going to be this kind of project that will uh, have um, Halim configurations and kernel configurations so that, uh, well, you can get a um, device to boot and this kind of stuff. Well, anyways, if you think it's interesting, tell me later and I, I will tell and get you in touch with the people who actually know about the project and maybe you can be friends, I don't know. Thank you for bringing it up, and I assume it may be interesting to some people in the audience or viewing the, the recording. Um, to me personally, obviously, the goal is to have OpenSUSE working, and that in the end requires to have, at some point, the OpenSUSE kernel working, where I understand that would then not, no longer be necessary. Yeah, right? Sure. Okay. Okay. For the questions? So you've highlighted a, a vast range of hardware, et cetera, and, and a lot of it doesn't appear to have upstream support, whether it be in the kernel or U-boot. Um, do you feel that ARM vendors are getting better at upstreaming, or is the situation still the same where the upstreaming of platforms is still really bad. And be honest. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think about the numbers in my head right now, but if you, uh, if you go through my slides afterwards, I think you will find quite a disappointingly high number of new boards where vendors are still sticking to the like old 
fire and forget BSP model where they do, you know, like a U, a B, um, a U boot port once based on whatever old version is. Well, in the, in, the, in the end, I think it's like a trickle down model that is still being used in many cases. So, like um, a particular chip vendor makes a U boot port, he passes that on to the board manufacturer. They may maybe do a few or um, two or three changes, but no major rebases, something like that. And that then gets shipped, and then it doesn't see any updates. I have seen, um, for example, um, well, um, NXP for a very long time has been active in um, both the Hubert community and the kernel community. Uh, Marvell is also very active in those spaces, well at least uh, Marvell Embedded Business Unit. Um, and there is um, a number of other vendors that are also doing great code, in, in particular on the, the kernel. Obviously there are some commercial like server vendors that don't need to do any Hubert work because they're using like uh, AMI commercial firmware um, that that simply works. Um, but I still feel that um, despite a lot of talks on this topic and lobbying, not all companies in particular when they're like new to Linux and only doing Android um, are, haven't really learned the lesson yet. And uh, if you see any ways how Arm, Linaro or any other um, organization, maybe the Linux Foundation or Free Software, um, whatever um, can, can help with that. Um, that. That would be absolutely awesome. On the other hand, I have seen individual companies um, getting more involved with, with open source, so there are certainly um, encouraging developments within the market. Um, like, for example, Rockchip is getting more and more active with their new 64-bit models. Yes. Um, or in other cases, you know, um, um, companies are simply seeing a need either being driven by um, enterprise distributions or for whatever reasons to um, contract other people to do that upstreaming work for them and still doing like to some degree parallel initial in-house development that will never go upstream and then have something that will go upstream. Um, but there's, in the end, there's still both parts of it. So things that are, have been improving and things that are still bad. Hello, um, have you heard of the Geekbox? It's a setup box with an RK30. Uh, you have? Yes. Oh, okay. So. Um, I worked on the U-boot port for that one. There, at this point in time, unfortunately, there is only um, serial output working. There's a bit more drivers contributed by Rockchip by now. Um, but last, uh, last time I tested it before the conference, it was not yet ready to really boot open ZUSA. But what I have done on there is um, I flashed an uh, Android style um, self-built kernel image using the upstream okay. kernel onto the, the boot partition and used that with an um, OpenSUSE rootfs file system. So it's possible to, to run OpenSUSE okay. on there if you're willing to get your hands dirty. Okay, so and uh, the next thing is I've got a Remix Mini. If you want, you can take a look at it later on. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Then thank you very much for your attention. I hope that there was something for, for your hardware in this talk. If not, come and talk to us about whether it's possible to get it supported or how likely something is to, to get done. And um, there is the OpenSUSE-R mailing list to um, ask questions or follow things that are, following, um, that ha that are happening. I admit that I don't usually spam people there with uh, all the stuff that I'm doing, but you can see the um, category ARM devices on the, Zusa, uh, the OpenSUSE wiki, um, where most boards that have been enabled have at least some stub page that you can see someone has already been looking into it. Um, if not, if you have some device and it's working, please document it in the wiki. And um, yeah, contributions are always very welcome. This is not a one-man show, so um, thank you for your support in doing this, also in, in providing test feedback as new kernels get updated or new images come out. And uh, thank you again.